Gentlemen, can I hand over and welcome Dr. Suzanne Siddiq. So today is um, a bit of a trying to reach the wider audience under this title, The Biology of Attainment. When we put that title together, Greg really liked it because he thought it was not immediately obvious what it might be about, which I liked too. And the fact that we don't know what it's about says something about the way that we are approaching attainment in the country. But it also turns out that I really like playing with language, so I am now never satisfied with a single title and I play with words to try and get my head around how else might you approach that topic. So we could also have called today the impact of emotional trauma on attainment. Or we could have called it what happens when schools help pupils fight anxiety. Or we could have called it what happens when an attainment strategy overlooks anxiety? And then that would have got us to what happens when an attainment strategy overlooks biology? Which is what I think we are doing in our attainment strategy for Scotland. And I'm worried about that. Let's start by thinking about the attainment challenge, which all of you will know about. It is the rage at the moment across the country. Everywhere I go in schools, I hear people talking about attainment. It's in all of the, doc, you know, lots of documents. That word, I mean, I know all of you have often used the word attainment. <clears throat> but because of the ta attainment challenge and the government's new vision, a lot more people are using the word attainment as well. So I want to think about what happens when you start a discussion from a place of controversy by pointing to Ken Robinson. And he's an educational philosopher and theorist. He has the most popular TED Talk ever delivered. If you don't know what TED Talks are, they're there are short talks, anywhere between three and 20 minutes, which are delivered by really good speakers, which are really designed to prompt us to think. And the most popular TED Talk, now delivered in the last 10 years, and available you know, on video across the globe, the most popular TED Talk has been delivered by Ken Robinson, and you can see down here at the bottom, it's been watched by nearly 45 million people, which is a lot of people. And he has a very controversial title. His theme is, Do Schools Kill Creativity? If they do, is he talking about your school? If he is talking about your school without even meaning to, he probably doesn't know your school. But if what he is talking about applies to your school, you probably don't mean to. In fact, the idea that your school could be killing creativity fills many people with not a great feeling. It makes us anxious to even consider that. And yet, it is the most watched TED Talk out there. So I really welcome that knowledge. It means that you can talk about controversial ideas and people want to hear them even though they feel scary. Because I want to move to a controversial theme closer <coughs> to our hearts. Here's my thesis today. Deep breath on my part. The Scottish attainment strategy will fail unless it takes account of children's biology. Here's another way to put that. The Scottish attainment strategy will fail 
unless it is based on an understanding of emotional trauma. Okay, here is some of the reason that I'm worried. Here's a new piece from John Swinney from last month in March entitled The Improvement, Improvement Agenda Requires All Our Focus. It's a great piece, except it never once has the word biology or physiology or trauma. And I know it's only one piece, but I read a lot of pieces about this now. And I virtually never see the word biology or physiology or trauma. And I'm worried because the science tells us that unless we take account of this, we're not able to address the things that are preventing children from learning, especially the ones who struggle the most. So I wonder if maybe we aren't getting it that we aren't getting what the science of attachment and connection and trauma is telling us. That we've got lots of knowledge, but somehow it is not fully translating to policy and practice. And I think that's the case for both our attainment strategy and also our expanded childcare vision. So we are doing some really exciting visionary things in the country at the moment. But if we do not take full account of what we now know about children's biology and the consequences of early stress and how that shapes the brain, then our visions for these initiatives will not succeed. And in fact, it's possible we could damage children further because we haven't paid attention to the relationship needs that they have. And there are more and more people that are worried that we're not getting it in a number of different countries. And by we, I mean societies. I mean those of us who make policies, and those of us who spend time with children, and those of us who care about children and our society. There are people who are worried that we're not quite getting it. Here's an example. This is Gaber Mate, and this is his book from 2010. And I love it because it has a title that also you're not quite sure what it means. The title of it is, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. And here's a tiny quote from it. He says in it that the three environmental conditions absolutely essential to optimal human brain development are, one, nutrition, two, physical security, and three, consistent emotional nurturing. And then he says something brave and perhaps controversial. The third one, emotional nurturance, is the one most likely to be disrupted in Western society. That's us. So let's just ask ourselves, is that true? Of these three, and we already know that nutrition is struggling for many families, is that true that in Western society we disrupt emotional nurturing and we do that in a country which has put quite a lot of investment and thinking into nurturing schools and nurturing units within schools? Is that your school that disrupts emotional nurturing? Is that your family? Is that your community? I think it takes great courage to ask that. And I, I would like to say I hope he's wrong, but I worry he's right. And I'm perfectly happy if you disagree with me or if you disagree with him, because the real question to ask is, is he right? Because if he's right, we're damaging our children without meaning to. Can you feel the silence that is descending in this room? It's one of those silences that you can kind of touch. I'm very grateful for that silence. It means that you're all thinking. <laughs> and I'm saying something that even if it's controversial or uncomfortable, it's helping us to think. And that's what I think Gabor Mate is trying to do. Here's somebody else then that is worried that we're not getting it. 
This is Erica Christakis, and she published a book in 2016 called The Importance of Being Little, which is a fabulous title. What preschoolers really need from grown-ups. And here's a quote that describes her thesis in this book. So this comes from one of the reviews of this book. Christakis argues in this book that most of today's youngest children are spending their early critical, early learning years in an environment that ignores or misunderstands their needs. The kind of respectful observation that, of, that children need of what they can and can't do is rare in early childhood settings. Like, is that true? We have put quite a lot of effort into our, our educational policies and our educational vision. We are about to expand our early learning and child care provision. And Erica Christakis, who's based in the US, thinks that the kind of environments that we're providing for early years for young children don't meet their needs. Is she right? Is she wrong? Is that an overstatement? Maybe it is an overstatement. Maybe it's so much of an overstatement that she should not be permitted to say that. And they should get her book off the shelves. She should not have been allowed to publish this book. Or maybe she's right. That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Is, is she right? Because if she's right, if she's right, then something about our policy is wrong. And we will not help children to fulfill their potential. And we might damage them without ever having meant to, if she's right. Because she's not the only one. This is Darcia Narvez. She published a book in 2014 with this title, Neurobiology and the Development of Human Morality, Evolution, Culture, and Wisdom. With a title like that, that's sitting on all your bedside tables, right? That's your nightly reading. I love this book, but I don't think most people will read it because it has a scary title. So the people who are most likely to read this are other academics and scientists. So the place that most people get their understanding of what Darcy and Narvez is saying is from these brilliant blogs that she writes and pieces, she puts pieces in other places. So here's a piece from January that she wrote entitled, Be Worried About Boys, Especially Baby Boys. And here's a quote from that piece. Boys are more vulnerable to neuropsychiatric disorders that appear in the early years, such as autism and ADHD. And I don't have to tell you that rates of autism and ADHD, or what some people would say, what is labeled as autism and ADHD. So in other words, we quickly get into debates about is ADHD a real thing? And, or is it a language for making sense of behavior? They're on the rise, how, however we understand the nature of that behavior. So Darcia Narvez goes on to say that early disorders have been increasing in recent years. Notably, she says, more babies are, have also been put into daycare settings, nearly all of which provide inadequate care for babies. Is she right? Or has she overstated? Has she overstated so much she shouldn't be permitted to say that? Or is she right for some settings? but not Scotland's settings. Or, okay, maybe some of Scotland's settings, wonder which ones. Maybe some of England's settings. Maybe more of America's settings. What if it's your setting? This is really hard to think about. So you are very brave this morning to join me. I know at one level you didn't really have a choice because you're sitting at your tables and I'm the one who brought the PowerPoint slides. If you, if you are willing to think about this at all, even if you disagree with it, I am grateful 
Because if she is right, that means people are providing settings and providing inadequate care without ever meaning to. How could that happen? And what would that look like? And what would be the consequences of that if we were doing that in our country in the midst of a time in which we are thinking a whole lot about what children need and expanding our policies? Because here's one more piece of research. Here's one more set of authors speaking to this. This is a piece of research that was published in 2015, and this is the social media conversion of it, so it converts it into language that's really accessible. So the title of this piece is Researchers Studied Kindergartners' Behavior and Followed It Up 19 Years Later. You don't get a whole lot of studies that do that. There are some very crucial ones across the across the globe, but they're pretty hard to conduct for that amount of time. So they're really worth talking about and paying attention to. It says, here are the findings. And then it says in a little strap line, it turns out that sharing really is caring. And here's what they did in that study. I'm giving you a really short version. You, of course, can go and read the much longer piece if you wish. It measured the social skills of 800 kindergartners and then it followed them up at the age of 25 to see what was happening in their lives. And on those scales, where they measured the skills, for every one point increase on the scale that they chose, that is an increase in social skills and social abilities, a child would be 54% more likely to finish secondary school, twice as likely to graduate from university, and 46% more likely to have a stable, full-time job at the age of 25. Yay! But for every one-point decrease on that scale, a child had a 67% higher chance of having been arrested in early adulthood, a 52% higher rate of binge drinking, and an 82% chance of being in public housing in the U.S. So the conclusion that those researchers came to, the bottom line, we need to do more than just teach kids information. We need to invest in teaching them how to relate to others. And the key theme I'm addressing today, how to handle the things they feel inside. Ignoring social skills in our curricula could have huge ramifications for our children down the road. And here's what it looks like when we ignore that, or we can't find a way to address it, or we mean to do well, we do the best we can with our resources, and we know it could be better, but it's the best we can do. Here are a few examples. This is a piece from The Guardian in 2015, which looked at children in care, and they asked local authorities across the whole of the UK how many times children had been moved during a year. And those findings showed that one in four foster children had been moved at least once to what we call a new placement. What that means is they had the world disrupted. When you go to a new placement, you have no idea how those people will relate to each other and what will be expected of you. It's like moving to a new planet. Some children, according to this survey, have moved seven times in a year. What if you have the child who's been moved to seven different plan planets in the year in your classroom? And they're behaving in a way that we label challenging behavior because they have a biology that is terrified. Here's another one. This is Pullman Prison. This is our Young Offenders Institution. I was there, I don't know, about two months ago for a meeting. Here are some figures from Pullman Prison. Two thirds of the young people in Pullman Prison have experienced four or more bereavements by the age of 15. Here's another one. Some of them have had 22 care placements by the age of 15. 
I think we should change the name of it. Instead of calling it a young offenders institution, we should call it a, an institution for young traumatized people. Our prisons are warehouses for traumatized people whose biology has been so affected by the trauma and stress and fear that they experienced that they can't manage their own behavior. And they do things that hurt other people and get themselves in all sorts of scrapes. And we pay a lot of money to punish them and put them into that warehouse. I'm not advocating a lot of that behavior. I'm asking if putting them into a warehouse is the best use of our funds and, our, and their lives and our efforts. Here's one more. This is from my local paper. So I've driven down from Dundee this morning with my team. So this is a piece from last year. Okay, it's the media. Okay, they chose the headline, but look at the headline. Pupils age three assaulted nursery staff in Dundee schools. And here's, here's a quote from it. Children as young as three have been disciplined for assaults on nursery school staff in Dundee. Do we really believe that three-year-olds assault adults? Is this just a cute headline, or does this help us to believe that three-year-olds are bad? I don't know what they did. Did they kick? Did they bite? Did they punch? Did they spit? They clearly had a meltdown. That means it was a terrified child. It was probably a traumatized child. And if we understand how biology leads to this kind of behavior, we think better about what they need. Which brings me to my title. <clears throat> when Greg and I decided on the biology of attainment, uh, many of you will know that I do quite a lot on social media. I always like to say, some part of me thinks that we should all turn off the media, we should find somebody's hand to hold, and we should go for a walk down the beach, because we have a lot of them in Scotland. Please laugh at that. Because <laughs> then you think, why don't we? More and more and more of us spend more and more time on computers. When biologically, we are built for engagement with other people. And you get a big oxytocin boost if you've got your, the hand of somebody to hold that you like walking down the beach. Okay. So when I popped up that I was coming to here to see all of you, I got unbelievable amount of engagement from that. Here are some of the things that people said. So first of all, that one post had a reach of 12,000 people. Kind of when I got up in the morning, I thought, "Real okay, that's quite a lot. And people said, this is a sorely neglected topic. Head teachers need to hear this. Someone from our setting needs to go to this. So perhaps that helped bring a few new people. I'm looking forward to hearing it, so I presume that whoever put that up is somewhere in the audience. When are you coming to speak to the Hedes? So in other words, we're not at the head teacher group here. And then several people said, please send a copy to Mr. Swinney. Okay. We might let him know that there's a video. But if you think that what I'm saying is useful, you might write to him and say, you think we need to think about this. Or you might write to your local education department. Or you might think about what, what do you think should be done with this information. Because that, that's what, we just need more of us to talk about it and to find the words that make sense to people. Because that brings me to my topic of trauma. We are now learning a lot about trauma, and trauma is one of the ways to describe or to capture the illustrations that I've already given this morning. And I want to talk about the ACE study, which stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And this is the image, the model, that this research group came up with to talk about their findings of a key study that was done in 1998. Okay, so here's, here's a very brief summary of what they did in this study. It was conducted between 1995 and 97 in the US, and it, it was developed by medical staff who had got increasingly interested in why some of the treatments that they were suggesting for a number of different medical conditions, and ultimately the one that really sparked it was weight loss, <clears throat> so people who were really struggling with weight problems, 
why those weren't working, and especially why many of the stories that, that they were hearing about people, their patients' lives included trauma. So they got interested in trying to systematically investigate the insights that they were gaining. And what they did was they worked with 17,000 patients, ordinary patients, not ones who were known to have trauma in their background, just ordinary patients coming for standard checkups, and they interviewed them about their past, <coughs> about their childhood, using uh, questionnaires and uh, interviews. So that becomes published in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine in 1998 under the title, The Relationship of Adult Health Status to Child Abuse and Household Dysfunction. And most of you probably also do not have on your bedside stands the American Journal of Preventative Medicine, especially not one from 1998. Here's then what that study found. They discovered that if you had had childhood experiences of stress and trauma and fear, it led to poor health outcomes and in adulthood. So let me go backwards. The 10 key experiences that they identified in this first study were if you'd experienced abu abuse, physical, emotional, or sexual, if you'd experienced neglect, emotional or physical, or if you had experienced what they called household dysfunction, which included your mother had been treated violently, there was substance misuse, you had a parent with mental illness, you had a parent in prison, or there was parental divorce. Now, there have been subsequent studies done, and they have uncovered some other key predictors like bereavement, violence in your neighborhood, poverty. But in this first study, which, which has gone on to be seminal in those 20 years, these were the 10 that they found. And what they were able to work out from their data is that the more of those you had experienced, the greater the likelihood that you had health outcomes like this. Liver disease, heart disease, drug abuse, alcoholism, early teen pregnancy, uh, smoking, suicide attempts, a whole range of health-related problems in quality of life. And what was surprising for them, they were really surprised at the strength of the relationship they could find between these childhood experiences and adult health. That was the first key insight, was the strength of this relationship. The second key insight was this one, was the prevalence of what they came to call adverse childhood experiences, <coughs> or fear, or stress, or what I call saber-toothed tiger moments in a life. So the number in their ordinary population in America, ordinary sample of the ordinary population in America, the number of people who reported having none of those experiences, or an ACE score of zero, was roughly a third. So that means two-thirds of the ordinary population in America had at least one of those. So the number of people who said their score was one was roughly a quarter. The number of people who said they would had two was 16%. The number of people who said three was 10%. And the number of people who said they had four or more of those adverse childhood experiences was 13%. 13% of the ordinary population had a score of four or more. But whenever I get to this part of me thinking about this, and I get to this slide, I find myself thinking, four or more. The reason that four or more, and I've stopped there on this slide, is because that's a kind of a landmark in the date. Once you've had four or more, you are kicked into a much higher risk category. And so I think, four or more, what's your life like if you have had four or more of those? What's a child's life like if their score is four? And thinking about the data this way helps us to realize that many of these traumas are nested, right? So if you 
if, you, if your mother is being treated violently, it's very likely that you are also experiencing physical or emotional abuse from your mother's partner. So we start to realize that it's, it's actually surprisingly easy to have a score that quickly climbs. And I remember presenting at a school once, and, I, and they, we were in a gym hall, and we were on a set of bleachers. There was a primary teacher just down here, and I was on the same level as everyone on that occasion. <clears throat> and I presented this, and I heard her gasp. <gasps> and you can imagine what I did. I went, well, that's very interesting. Tell us why you just gasped. The poor woman hadn't realized she'd gasp, and now, of course, she was wishing she could climb underneath the bleachers and... But she shared with her colleagues why she gasped. She said, 13%. I have 30 children in my classroom. That's three children in my classroom. I need to know which ones they are. And I clearly have remembered that, because I often tell that story. Because it lets us ask, do these, do these data apply to Scotland? These are American data. So are the, um, are the American figures representative of, of Scottish figures? But, or are we better in Scotland? Or are we worse? Should we be doing an ACE study ourselves? Wales has just done an ACE study so that they know what the prevalence of adverse childhood experiences is in, in, amongst their children. You can look that up. We haven't yet done that, but part of the discussion going on in, in uh, NHS help in, N in the NHS in Scotland, we now have what's called an ACE hub. Many of you may not know that. That's okay. It takes a while for information to get out, but we now have one. And one of the questions that they are asking is, should we be doing a Scottish ACE study? Or do we know enough about ACEs and we shouldn't be putting money into doing more research? We should be doing more things to develop initiatives to help children who've experienced those. Because this is how they explained their data. This is their model. That if a child has experienced adverse childhood experiences, the researchers concluded that that leads to disruptive neurodevelopment that changes your biology, your brain and your body. That results in social, emotional, and cognitive impairment that makes it hard to learn, that makes it hard to control your behavior, that makes it hard to, to have social friendships and read faces. It makes it hard to have the basic things that, that the kindergarten study that, we, that I mentioned a minute ago is talking about. That leads to the adoption of health risk behaviors like smoking, drinking, drugs. That leads to disease, disability, and social problems. And that leads to early death. Some areas of Glasgow, the average rate of death is 54 years old. When Harry Burns talked about these data, he used to say, we will not solve those health problems in Glasgow and in other areas of the country <clears throat> through increasing just our anti-smoking campaigns or our get fit campaigns. We need to think about how we love our children, about how much we cuddle them, about how safe they feel in our communities and their homes and their schools. So, if you want to know more about the ACE study data when you leave here today, here's the best way I know how to do it. This is Nadine Burke Harris's TED Talk in which she's talking about this study. And you, so you can Google that and 20 minutes later you learn a lot about it. Here's another one. This is a piece that was on Radio 4 last year <coughs> called Unhappy Child, Unhealthy Adult. And the thing that's striking about this piece is it looks at the landmark of six because the first landmark is a score of four and the next landmark that really boosts is what happens if you have a score of six. That helps us to think about the figures in care are that if you have been in care by the age of 25, you are 20 times more likely to be dead than a child who is not in care. And it's exactly these kinds of data and that help us to understand how that is possible. <clears throat> so this study, this program is addressing that. There are organizations that are thinking about how to put this information into practice in schools and other settings. So this is the ACEs Too High organization. It's specifically addressing schools. So you can have a look for what are they recommending and what are they doing at ACEs Too High. 
Some people now use the phrase trauma-sensitive schools. It means very similar things to what we mean with the language of nurturing schools. But it helps us to think about how you need a whole school approach. And it also lets us ask whether our nurture provision at the moment is trauma-informed. And do we think that we are providing trauma-led care when we put together a nurture base? Some people are really stressing the intergenerational nature of this. So trauma, if trauma affects your body, it also affects your genes, and you pass those down to your children and your grandchildren. So that helps us to start to understand why you see some of the same problems generation after generation in the same family or the same community. So if we want to address poverty, we cannot do that just through uh, you know, financial rejuvenation, and fi we need to think about what is happening biologically in a community. And what I am delighted to say is that there's one new, more new resource. There's a new film out called Resilience, all about the ACE study. It came out in America last year, and there are several of us in Scotland that have been anxiously awaiting its arrival in the UK. And I'm delighted to say it premieres in the UK today in London. They're having their London premiere this evening at 6 o'clock. And we're having our Scottish premiere in Glasgow on Saturday. Because there are three partners who got together. There's my organization, there's the organization called Reattachment, and NHS Health Scotland got together to bring this film to Scotland. This film is now available as a resource. So you could show it at school CPDs, you could bring together a cluster. This is the best way I know to help people to get it. Because I am not the first person to have talked about these. In the 1950s hospitals, they were worried about the same things, that hospital practice was damaging children. And what the key researchers at that time concluded was that the reason that hospitals were not changing their practice quickly enough and were damaging children without meaning to was that the appropriate sense of urgency and alarm was missing in the impact of hospital practice on children's experience. And I know I haven't given a whole lot of details about that, but my point is, if hospitals could unintentionally be damaging children in the 1950s, could we be unintentionally damaging children in 2017? And for me to choose the word damage is a scary word but you started out brave with me, so I want to keep us thinking, could we accidentally be having long-term impacts and causing more stress to children that we never meant to? So as I wind down, that reminds us, what happens when you try and change a nation? Because I think that's where we are. I think we have arrived at a landmark moment in Scottish history. We are. We are trying to think in new ways about what our children need through the attainment challenge and through the expanded child care provision. And I want to remind us that once upon a time, schools in themselves were a new vision. So if we go back just really, just, you know, not into 1900s, so really just a little over 100 years ago, once upon a time, there were campaigners who thought that we should have children in school. And they thought that because at the same time, we put children up chimneys. A hundred years ago, these are the children, same age as the ones in your school. And do you know part of how that happened a hundred years ago? You see postcards like this one. So you could buy this postcard in 1904 and send it to your best friends. It's an image of the cheery chimney sweep. What we tell ourselves about our children influences what we offer them, the services we offer them, if services in the right way, the relationships, the way in which we create safe environments. What we tell ourselves shapes what we offer our children. So there are some people who thought this was not okay. We should be feeding children. Even if they didn't have shoes, we should be feeding them. There were some people who had the outrageous idea that we should provide gardens for them where they could get fresh air. 
because that wasn't what they got when they went home. I want to wind down by reminding us that once upon a time, the things that we now take for granted in schools were a vision that campaigners fought for and they succeeded in, or you wouldn't be in schools teaching. And in that same century, some people thought women should have a vote. And they changed that. And in 1948, we had an NHS because some people had a vision for it and they fought for it. So what I'm trying to remind us is that the key things that we come to take for granted when a nation changes are because some people thought it could be different and it ought to be different. And we are now in 2017 trying to think about what our children need in education. And I think that unless we think more about the biology, they're not going to get that. And if I end on one fast story, here's an even easier way. Let's just change our language. This is Patuka East Primary School in Fife. And this is their head teacher, Jen Nissen. And she came to a training session like this. And she came back to tell me the key message she had taken away. She said this. All we did was change our language. We stopped using the phrase challenging behavior, and we started using the phrase distressed behavior. Because we came to understand that the children who were exhibiting bad behavior were distressed, and we needed to help them. And she says that that simple language change, which they got for free, all it took was some thinking and willpower, she says it transformed their school. So better understanding children's biology does not take gigantic programs or funding. What it takes is our understanding, which is why I went in by saying, that if we do not help our children feel safe, then we cannot help them learn in this country that we want to be the best place in the world to grow up. Thank you very much.